Hello everyone, this is Joshua Smith of Apollo's Artifacts. It is November of 2019. So as many of you know, the FBI dropped a large amount of material about the finders recently. I've had several people ask me if I was going to put together a video on it, and I decided to do so. So first of all, if you're not familiar with the finders, there's a little thumbnail sketch that I'll go over here, but also I'll link below a video that I made where I talk about them earlier. So the way the finders came to the attention of uh, the populace at large was on the morning of February the 4th, 1987, a woman observed a well-dressed man at a park, which was nearby to where she lived, and she noticed that this man was watching over uh, about six children who appeared to be very unkempt. They were improperly dressed considering the weather. Uh, they were very dirty, their hair was a mess, and so forth, so she called the police. Once the police showed up at the scene, they found that there were not just one, but two well-dressed men driving a van with the six unkempt children who were dressed inappropriately, had bug bites all over their bodies, they were dirty and hungry. The van smelled terribly, and it also had a mattress in the back that was clearly being used for the children to sleep on. Together, the men were relatively uncooperative. Uh, suspect number one gave a few answers. Suspect number two was completely uncooperative, and once they were being placed under arrest, decided to fake a faint and flop over on the ground. They were separated from the children. The children were taken by the uh, Department of Human Services in Florida after they had been separately questioned by the police. The police said that the children uh, behaved uh, very strangely. They were not familiar with common office objects. They were unfamiliar with typewriters and staplers. Uh, they were um, urinating and defecating on the floor inside of the police station. Uh, and this, of course, contradicts the story being told by the two men where they said that they were on the way to Mexico in order to found, start, or establish some kind of a school for brilliant children. And this seems to be some sort of a Montessori school type scam that was being ran by this group. Uh, clearly, these uh, children were not particularly bright, even uh, having the ages of a range of two to seven years old, if they don't know what staplers are or typewriters and are urinating in the floor and defecating in the floor. This is not normal or bright behavior at all. So anyway, this led to a broader look into the finders uh, once they contacted the Washington, D.C. Uh, Metro Police Department. Uh, one of the first things that was said to them was, oh, you have some of those guys. We've been looking into them, too. This is actually in part of this uh, document dump here that you'll be able to see for yourself. Uh, later, they were to find out that the FBI had prior investigations into them, that the CIA had been watching over them for a significant period of time. And uh, in my estimation, anyway, were, the uh, CIA was directly involved in this. I believe that the entire thing was part of an intelligence operation where they were um, gathering compromising information on uh, various politicians and other people, shall we say. So the first thing I would like to do is uh, suggest that you go to the YouTube pages of uh, Derek Bros for The Conscious Resistance. He has a great video that just came out on it. The other one I would say to go to is uh, Jason Burmis. He has a number of videos that he's put out on it as he's done uh, deep dives into the documents themselves. And of course, over at We've Read the Documents with uh, John and uh, his sometime co-host, George of CavDef, they do an excellent job of re reviewing all of this kind of material. So mine is sort of just uh, supplementary to what uh, these individuals have done because they've covered it in fantastic fashion. And anyway, as they uh, looked into the finders, what they found is they were sort of a uh, communalist type group uh, with all of these hippy-dippy uh, left-wing uh, sort of views. They threw in a kind of a mishmash of uh, Eastern uh, philosophy, you know, sort of uh, some Buddhist type concepts. They were clearly a cult organization, if not an, a directly occult organization. And I uh, personally would not really call them uh, Satanists. I know that that's a thing that seems to be going around a lot and has been uh, since that time. I would say uh, that they're definitely pagan, uh, definitely a group of pagan communalists. And there are very, very suspicious things going on uh, in relation to uh, children and the way that they apparently acquired children from different places around the world. There are things in the documents that suggest that they were having uh various procedures to impregnate the women who were members of the cult, uh, 
don't really know if that was against their will or not. That's hard to tell. That's uh, something that we'll actually cover more in an episode that I'm going to do on the John of God character, where he has been accused of uh, forcibly having uh, women impregnated and then their uh, children stolen from them and then put up for adoption for many thousands of dollars. Now, I'm not saying here that that's what the finders were doing, but there are things here that suggest that they were up to some uh, very shady things uh, vis-a-vis uh, women and children. So when you pull up the document, one of the first things you'll note is that in the first section, uh, this is out of a total of 324 total pages that we have uh, access to. There are some 176 pages that have been deleted for a variety of reasons. Now, some of this is because it's uh, duplicated material, but some of it, and I will uh, link this below for you, is uh, being redacted for a number of reasons. There are literally thousands upon thousands of redactions in this. Now, there are other versions of this that were released previously that are basically unredacted versions, and you can get those, but I'm only looking right now at the most recent uh, FBI document dump on this. But I have here the OIP coded reports for the redaction codes. I'm going to link that for you also so that you can check out the reasons uh, that they're giving for some of these uh, redactions. And some of the more interesting ones are this uh, exemption B3, uh, not just uh, federal uh, grand jury information, which of course is a uh, what they're trying to gain access to in Congress right now so they can try to make up something to impeach Trump over that they're trying to pull out of the uh, Mueller report. But the second segment that we have here, Exemption B-3-2, related to intelligence sources and methods prohibited from disclosure by the National Security Act. Now, you would think that if the finders were just some silly hippy-dippy cult and nothing else was really going on and the CIA wasn't involved or no other intelligence services were involved, why would we have these exemptions for the National Security Act uh, still being applied from 1987? It seems a little bit ridiculous to me. And uh, this, this all came about as a result of a different investigation that was uh, followed up on in uh, the early 1990s, like 1993, with two members of Congress who were trying to find out if intelligence services were involved in the shutting down of the investigation of the finders, which I definitely believe to be the case and that it was the CIA that had that done. Now, a number of the exemptions are due to uh, what they're calling unwarranted invasions of personal privacy. Of course, we can all understand that. Uh, that would be addresses and phone numbers and things like that, or people who really were only peripherally uh, involved or associated and didn't really do anything wrong. But again, here we do have other exemptions that are for... Um, what they list as B7E redactions, and that is information that would reveal techniques authorized for and used in national security investigations. So this is two different times we see this being used to redact portions of these documents. So since I'm considering this to be basically just a sup supplemental episode to some of the others that have been done, I'm going to do kind of a a random perusal of some of the documents. It's not going to be particularly systematic, and I'm not going to go through page by page. One of the things I find interesting about it is that the FBI was actually tracking uh, some of the media reporting about the finders. And one in particular that jumps out to me is a Washington Times front page report that they have documented in here. That one is titled, CIA Tied to Cult Accused of Abuse, Justice Probes Links to Finders. And this was actually written by Paul Rodriguez. Now, people who are familiar with the Franklin cover-up that would be the Larry King uh, child prostitution ring, as covered in the documentary Conspiracy of Silence and a documentary that I'm currently working on right now myself. You'll know that uh, Paul Rodriguez actually spoke with John DeCamp, Senator John DeCamp from Nebraska, who was looking into Larry King's nefarious affairs. And uh, what Rodriguez was able to reveal to him is that the largest homosexual prostitution network ever which was in Washington, D.C., and infiltrated all the way up into the White House itself. And it was uh, headed over by a guy who claimed to actually be in the CIA, Craig Spence. Uh, it was shown that Craig Spence actually had a relationship with Larry King as well, and that they may have indeed uh, used some of the same children, procured these children for the use of this uh, nationwide uh, network of child trafficking, child prostitution, which actually involved uh, drug trafficking as well. And uh, one of the strange things is if you uh, go on MapQuest and you put in the addresses uh, for 
Larry King's uh, place that he had up in D.C., Craig Spence's place up in D.C., you'll find that they were literally only about one minute apart. You could walk from one house to the other in just a, a few minutes. Not only that, but if you put in the addresses to the Finder's Warehouse and the Finder's House, you'll find also that they were in very close proximity of both Larry King and Craig Spence as well. So that's just a bit of food for thought. It would not surprise me in the least to, to find out at some point down the road that there was some sort of a loose association between, say, the leader, the so-called game caller of the Finders, uh, Marion Petty, or the uh, original founders of the Finders cult, uh, the CIA, Craig Spence, and Larry King. <clears throat> now, among the odd items uh, that were found... Uh, once the FBI began to uh, conduct some raids of the warehouse, uh, a farm in Virginia, uh, where it was said, by the way, uh, by witnesses that on this farm in Virginia that uh, there were cages there on site. And uh, once they identified those and pointing them out to the FBI agents, they said that, yes, when the children are brought here, they are put in or kept in those cages. Um this, to me, also brings uh, to mind, once again, the Franklin cover-up case where we had Paul Benassi uh, testifying to Gary Caradori as part of that investigation that he was taken to a place that was uh, later uh, identified and figured out to actually be uh, Bohemia Grove, uh, where he claimed that he and a couple of other children were uh, massively and horrendously abused and uh, that... Uh, you know, these kids also were put into a cage. So these are um, sort of just uh, random associations, but, you know, it could uh, mean something a little bit more uh, than maybe what you think at first. But anyway, as part of uh, the raids on, on these uh, various places, uh, one of the things they found was a rather strange uh, letter that was titled The Three Wives of Gung Ho. And there seems to be some connection between the finder's cult and uh, overseas travel, uh, particularly to places that were banned uh, for travel during the Cold War, uh, usually only uh, people who are spies or somehow associated with the CIA or military intelligence would be able to make these kinds of trips. But they seem to have a, a number of contacts with China and possibly even either procured children from China or sold children from America to uh, people in China. Uh, so, in part, uh, the letter uh, that was found there reads as follows. This is to testify that your son Douglas, a.k.a. Ernest Angel, I, Betterson, uh, Dene Proper, Kenny Rogers, is a true master of the art of effing. The shape of his C word is unique, and he is truly an artist at using it to give us the most pleasure. The depth, the width, the heights. No other man touches us in this way. His hands have magic as they stroke our slender limbs in moist P-words. Words cannot describe the tender passion that Douglas brings to our orgiastic pleasures. And uh, mind you, all of this uh, uh, very strange material is found in a warehouse that seems to be um, having various staging areas set up where things are being filmed. Uh, there are a number of people who suspect that perhaps um, abuse of some of the children had been photographed or filmed there, uh, but some of the members of the founders claim otherwise. There's also a number of suggestions that people were suspicious that mind control uh, was taking place uh, once they found a library. Among the searches of the uh, finder's property, they found a number of books that were on the subject of mind control. Um, there was a police officer involved who, uh, when she examined the children, that she believed that they were the victims of brainwashing. And uh, according to these documents here, there were other people who described the children as being like shells or zombie-like in their behavior. Um, another interesting thing about the finders is uh, you, you see that um, the finders would travel around the country and they were uh, able to use uh, computers. Uh, you know, this all of this stuff was uh, very rudimentary at the time, but they were able to use what was called MCI mail. And uh, they could leave messages to one another, and they were basically like uh, emails. And those could be uh, left and retrieved anywhere that uh, they had uh, phones or a computer and a uh, modem hookup. And anyone with the uh, password, uh, you know, for a receiving end would be able to obtain these uh, messages. Uh, so the Congress people who were looking into this were uh, Representative Charles Rose 
and Representative Tom Lewis. Uh, Rose, according to a variety of sources, seemed to have some rather shady things in his personal background, but in terms of Lewis, I haven't been able to find anything uh, negative about him. Everyone has uh, basically only positive things to say about him, so he seems to have been a genuine truth seeker in this whole matter. Now, one of the other peculiar things about this that a lot of people have noticed is that when you go to page 49 of the PDF file on the documents that were released, all of a sudden we start finding material that originated with uh, Ted Gunderson's investigations of the McMartin Preschool. So really, uh, this finders thing, I mean, it links over into uh, the Franklin cover-up and the McMartin Preschool case in uh, interesting ways. Perhaps not so much just on Satanism, but in terms of paganism and uh, occultish uh, behavior. So anyway, there have been some people who raised questions about the inclusion of this. They said, uh, well, you know, how did this get in there? Was it dropped in on accident or something like that? But I definitely think it was intentional that these documents were included. And some people have said, well, you know, was this really tied to the archaeologist report um, that took place? So I'm actually going to show you here on screen right now the archaeological investigation here that was done uh, of the McMartin Preschool by Gary Stickle. And you can see uh, quite plainly here in his executive summary when people had questions about, you know, the children talked about there being tunnels, were there tunnels, were there not. Um, this was not ever included at the trial. This uh, was being done during the second uh, trial, basically the retrial. And none of this material ever uh, was admitted into the courtroom, and it was not publicly available until uh, quite some time after uh, the May of 1990 investigation that they did. But anyway, you can see here from Stickle's report, he says the project unearthed not one but two tunnel complexes as well as previously unrecognized structural features, which defied logical explanation. Both tunnel complexes conform to locations and functional descriptions established by children's reports. One had been described as providing undetected access to an adjacent building on the east. The other provided outside access under the west wall of the building and contained within it an enlarged cavernous artifact corresponding to children's descriptions of a secret room. So for anybody who just uh, dismisses this uh, kind of material out of hand, you need to contend with this 13-page document here that talks about it. And also, private investigator Ed Opperman has interviewed a geologist who was a part of these teams that did investigations there. And he also confirms that there was a, another secret area to all of this that could have uh, fit what some of the children described. But again, none of this material was ever admitted into court. None of it was uh, ever included in the trial itself, unfortunately. And overall, what the uh, congressional investigation was uh, related to here, as it is uh, listed in the documents repeatedly, is uh, white slave traffic um, and uh, the sexual exploitation of children and ultimately obstruction of justice if indeed it was determined that the CIA was involved, but of course the CIA is too powerful even for Congress to be able to look into. Uh, one of the sections here that was listed in the Department of Justice's reasons for these reviews uh, was that uh, it, it was indicated to them that uh, during the execution of the search warrants uh, by the MPD, which would be the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan, Metropolitan Police Department, at the two finders' properties, they observed a substantial amount of computer equipment and documents purportedly containing instructions for obtaining children for unspecified purposes. The instructions included the impregnation of female members of the community, purchasing children and trading children, and kidnapping them. Now, one of the things that I also find interesting here that I haven't really seen anybody else talking about are two particular sections here, which is on page 43. We have a uh, redacted also advised that he had been told that documentation had been located in the WMPD files to indicate that Sergeant John Steicher, deceased, or Stitcher, who had been his uh, sergeant during the finder search, had been contacted by redacted who told him to step away from the finder's case, allegedly redacted. WMFO conducted an investigation in this matter, and this information will be subsequently reviewed. I don't know of any results of that that ever came. On 10 93 George Bergasso, Section Chief, Child Exploitation and Obscenity Section, Department of Justice, advised that the DOJ has a book of material on the finders and additional material that will be made available for review by the FBI. 
So that part is also quite strange. Has anyone ever obtained this book of material? Representative Tom Lewis, by the way, he was looking into this, uh, was a Republican, and he was a World War II veteran for anyone who is interested. But as we scroll down a bit here to page 52 in the document, we see a finder's chronology. And one of the things that jumps out to me here is this portion where it says, after search warrant shut down on first day, news reports carried FBI press release announcing FBI as lead investigating agent, which they misspelled here. Day after, uh, once search resumed, FBI agent from Washington field office, WFO, makes a walkthrough of warehouse but does not examine any seized evidence. Additional search warrant executed on farm in rural Virginia with support by Virginia State Police. No federal involvement. Evidence of satanic slash cult ritual discovered. But I do find it odd here that they don't point out that there's uh, evidence of cages on the site where someone said that children had been kept at various times. And then again, of course, we have another large redacted section of material related to this. And you come down a bit below this, redacted, contacts MPD intelligence and advise that all reports regarding finders are to be classified at the secret level. Redacted also advised that no information was to be turned over to the FBI WFO for investigation and that the WFO would not be advised of the redacted involvement contact. I would say that's pretty important, would you not? So we scroll down here a bit more and we find on page 56 something else of note. Prior to 2587, that would be before the day um, after that these uh, two individuals had been taken into custody, MPD Redacted had received information from a confidential source that a group of people calling themselves the Finders were conducting brainwashing techniques at Redacted. So there are multiple references in this to brainwashing, mind control, the children appearing to be brainwashed. And we uh, go down a bit further here. This is page 64. You can see very clearly this was formally classified as secret. We have down here on a portion under source information. This is in December of 1986, right? So uh, the children and uh, other people involved said that it was sometime in December of 1986 that they originally left from the D.C. area on their way to uh, supposedly founding this uh, school for bright children or intelligent children or whatever, but had stop-offs in Kentucky and Florida along the way. So anyway, a person had reported them, and if you go down here and look a little bit into what it was, it says here that there were certain members who were interested in exploring Satanism. That's very odd. Then we come over here a bit further. You know, they talk a little bit more about the so-called smart school in Mexico. But it says here, Redacted stated that the children were all extremely hungry and urinated and defecated on the floor during the interviews. Now, again, that's what I was pointing out to you in the beginning. Does that sound like something that smart school children do? Uh, over here on the next page, 66, we have other strange things under family members. Detective Redacted interviewed all the family members who were willing to talk. Specifically, they all stated that Redacted had brainwashed their children and prevented any contact with either their children or grandchildren. Members of the Finders, according to family members, would stop any contact by sending letters describing explicit sexual acts involving current members, including photographs and drawings. So, so someone was taking photographs of these things. In the redacted case, members of the Finders attempted to take over the redacted family residence and force redacted out of her home. And then we come down here a bit further. We see this very strange thing. During Virginia State's investigation, information was revealed that bodies were buried on the farm at the nethers, but excavation revealed nothing. And of course, I wonder, did you actually excavate in the appropriate places? Remember, there were a number of bodies that John Wayne Gacy, for example, buried that no one ever found, but we have uh, very strong suspicions as to where some of those still are even today, and uh, those cannot be accessed, unfortunately. Uh, it continues here, however, cages were discovered on the premises that witnesses revealed were used to keep children during their visits to the farm. Hello, this alone makes all of this very, very shocking and disturbing. Um, why is it uh, that people are not flipping out about this? Uh, we go down here a little bit further and we see here FBI investigation. The FBI had contact with the finders since 1971. 
including a recent report dealing with CIA involvement with at least one of the members of the finders passing information overseas concerning activities of the CIA. And of course, the FBI predictably vacated that investigation as well. And uh, when I get over into some of the Franklin material, you're really going to be uh, uh, taken for uh, a number of surprises and just how corrupt the FBI has been in the past when they're dealing with these uh, nationwide uh, child sex trafficking cases. And we come down here to the concluding portion of this. This is on page 67. Lastly, I do not feel that the finders have disbanded as reported by their leaders, but instead as reported in their master plan have appeared to disband to prevent further detection by law enforcement or social service officials. I firmly believe that this group should be monitored in a general sense, and if further developments occur, they should be noted. So if you happen to be one of those people who just think this is some kind of silly fodder for conspiracy theory material, you're the one who needs to go and have your head checked out, because this is very strange. Um... There's uh, an other, other things I find rather peculiar about all, the, all of this is that the, uh, the finders people said that they had left uh, sometime right before Christmas on the way to Mexico. So that would be probably around uh, Christmas Eve, December 24th, but they were picked up in Florida on February the 4th. So they really didn't make very much progress during that time, and they easily could have been in Mexico by then. Now, there's a, uh, another thing that I find interesting. It says uh, later in the documents, on February 7, 1987, this investigator was advised that there was a bomb threat telephoned into the treehouse. And this is where the uh, children were taken by the Department of Human Services personnel to be kept separate from the people who they suspected, at least at the time, of possibly kidnapping them or trafficking them or abusing them or whatever. But I don't think that this uh, bomb threat was just some kind of a happy coincidence because we do also know from other materials in this that other members of the Finders knew about what was going on, knew who had their members, and I think that it was probably someone with them who actually called in this bomb threat. Now, how no charges ever developed from any of this is, uh, again, surprising as so many things are in this case. And to me, that just uh, continues to suggest some sort of intelligence operation involvement, uh, most likely CIA. That would be my strong suspicion anyway. Some more interesting material is when we move down here to page 149. This is in the section on the Tallahassee Police Department offense reporting forms. We see here, uh, it says, Sergeant Redacted stated that when his agency served the search warrant on 2587, they found no one, but they did find a computer bulletin board message that said that the group in Tallahassee has been caught. We are scared and hiding. So why would they be scared and hiding if there was nothing thought to be going on? You know, for example, if I were traveling in, in two separate cars with a group of people, I would be actually you know, wanting to contact the Tallahassee Police Department to find out why my friends had been taken into custody and find out uh, what was going on, what we needed to do to resolve that situation. Uh, most certainly you would not be scared and going into hiding unless you thought that they thought you were up to something no good. Correct? I think so. More material of interest is found down on page 155. It says here 12.05 p.m., Contact with Lieutenant Redacted of Culpeper, Virginia Police Department. Redacted stated that he worked a case in the past. Through this investigation, learned that Redacted had at one time lived in Ocala, Florida. Redacted stated that he did not know where Redacted was at this time. He stated that he was familiar with Redacted and had a contact with the cult finders. Redacted said that the contact told him that Redacted put the word out to the members to flee and hide. This is probably Marion Petty, I would imagine. Redacted stated that Redacted himself would probably go to Andrews Air Force Base and get a military plane flight to China. Does this not strike anyone as extraordinarily peculiar? Now we know that Marion Petty was in the Army Air Force uh, way back in the day when those two things were still combined. Uh, by this time, you know, the Air Force had separated off and I guess he continued to have some kind of association with that. And that's one of the things that will come out later. Uh, in the Franklin case that Larry King himself also had some association with the Air Force since he had been in and was probably involved in uh, Air Force intelligence or other military intelligence operations. 
Over here on the next page, uh, we have at 12.40 p.m., Inspector Redacted, San Francisco Police Department Redacted, stated that a local paper has printed an article that indicates that San Francisco is involved in this case. I advise that I know of no information indicating San Francisco advised him. We have no media contact with Redacted. But uh, to me, I believe this is probably talking about the Presidio case, which also involved um, accusations of satanic uh, ritual child abuse. Now, I also do not know of any direct connection between these two things, but I'm almost positive that this is about the Presidio. In another section that I find of a peculiar coincidence, perhaps, uh, this is on page 161, when they're talking about the TRS-80 computer that was used for them to communicate, it says... Um, also on Sunday, February 8, a part-time employee of TPD, redacted also an FSU student, brought another TRS computer to TPD and turned it over to this investigator. He in indicated that he was in front of the FSU library and found it at an outside phone on Thursday morning, February 5. He indicated that he had learned how to work it and found messages in it that had names of TPD investigators, redacted, and others. He thought it might have something to do with this case and therefore brought it to TPD. And of course, it was related to the case. Uh, this was another group of the finders, probably the ones who said that they were scared and in hiding and were uh, following the orders of Marion Petty, the game caller, to go hide. And over on the next page, we see that as they searched the contents of the van, they actually ended up finding uh, not just this, which you will see here on this page on 162, but that both persons seem to have multiple AKAs or other identities that they went by at various times. Uh, we go down a bit further in the documents. This is page uh, 170 and 171. You see that they're uh, living a lifestyle based on some kind of a hippy-dippy 1960s commune concept. They want to... Uh, eliminate private property except for very small items. All major uh, large items or whatever are supposed to be owned by the group collectively, which is just nonsense. But we see down here one of the uh, mantras uh, that's so common today. The, the group say that they prefer as much diversity as possible. So at least they get those uh, diversity and inclusion uh, points there. A bit further down here on page 175, we see this whole uh, thing described as strange circumstances, which is probably what I should title this episode because everything involving the finders is a bunch of strange circumstances for sure. Coming down here a bit further, we see on page 177, we see that uh, they were speaking with people involved with the Easter Seals. Now, the Easter Seals, for those who don't know, help uh, disadvantaged children, children with various uh, disabilities and such. Now, something interesting is when you listen to the interviews with Rusty Nelson, who was involved in the Franklin cover-up, he was the official photographer for Larry King and the group, although he did not want to be involved in some of the uh, more nefarious and heinous things that were taking place in Nebraska at that time, also had been taking uh, pictures for the Easter Seals. So I just thought that was a an interesting uh, connect here between the whole uh, Franklin thing and the Finder's case. And as I'm uh, scrolling through here, there are an entire list that you'll find throughout these documents of these uh, other businesses, uh, sort of business fronts or whatever that were set up by the Finders. This is a classic way that CIA front operations work, and also you'll see that with the uh, Communist Chinese. They do the same thing with all kinds of uh, front companies that operate on behalf of their military and intelligence sections. But we see down here on page 203, we have another thing that's of interest to me anyway. Uh, this section here says an extortion case opened on 7-14-1983, and that too is related to the finders. So these people had uh, numerous contacts with and exposure to various uh, levels of law enforcement in all kinds of uh, cases and places prior to these arrests in 1987. And as we go down a bit further, we have here on page 209, we have a whole other section of deleted page material. Another 124 total pages that are deleted out. Now, numerous of these, of course, are duplicates, but some are held out, as I mentioned before, for things that could be of uh, more notable interest, shall we say. But this 324-page uh, document would be you know, closer to 700 pages if we could have all of the additional materials that have been excised. Uh, down here on page uh, 212, on a, a memorandum sheet that we have at the bottom, we see some more very strange uh, information here uh, where uh, 
someone had suggested that the children perhaps had uh, computer chips implanted into their heads. I don't think there's really any uh, support for material like this. I think this is a, a bit too far out uh, for that particular time frame. And uh, we come down here to page 225, uh, also another section that was uh, listed as secret in the draft section. And we can see here in this that it's uh, documented that the CIA was indeed tracking the movements of various members of the finders. And down here at the bottom of page 225, we see that an overview report prepared by Detective Redacted It goes down here to say this report stated that it is this writer's belief that the finders organization is and has been utilized by the CIA as a disinformation service spreading non-essential, non-critical information to various organizations throughout the United States and overseas. Over here on the next page, we have a section. This is 226. Um, cursory examination of the documents revealed detailed instructions for obtaining children for unspecified purposes. The instructions included the impregnation of female members of the community known as finders, purchasing children, trading, and kidnapping. <clears throat> The memo notes that on 2687, the USCSSA had met an MPD detective at the warehouse on 4th Street and he was granted unlimited access to the premises and he was able to observe numerous documents which described explicit sexual conduct between the members of the community known as finders. The memo reports that the USCSSA saw a large collection of photographs of unidentified persons, some of which were nude and believed to be members of finders. Next, we come down to page 244. We have this section of an affidavit. It says on December 15, 1986, Detective Redacted responded to the area of Glover Park in the rear of the building, <clears throat> observed a clearing approximately 70 yards behind the house and several stumps surrounding the open area. Several round stones have been gathered near the circle. This practice is sometimes used in satanic rituals and evidence that several persons had gathered in the clearing recently. In the rear yard was a small, very ornate gravestone propped up against the support pillar for the porch. So that's not really dispositive of anything. It is a little bit strange, uh, probably not so much satanic as I said before, uh, more pagan. If you wish to uh, interpret the finders as being a satanic group, I'm not really going to argue with you all that much about it. And that basically uh, brings me to an end here on the finders. I do think that they were a pagan uh, communalist group that was associated with the CIA, perhaps even uh, founded by the CIA and entirely directed by the CIA for a number of nefarious purposes. Uh, again, I would not be surprised to find out if they had some kind of connections between uh, themselves and Craig Spence, also of the D.C. area, and ultimately with Larry King in Omaha, Nebraska. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to like, subscribe, and share. Thank you.